so let's start okay so uh, what do we what do we mean by stroke so you must have read in your medicine also and um, so anything basically resulting due to the occlusion of or any interruption in the blood supply is the major cause of stroke so if we define it it is defined as the sudden occlusion or rupture so anything causing a cessation in the blood supply either due to the occlusion or due to the rupture of cerebral artery or vein resulting in focal cerebral damage along with the clinical neurological symptoms or deficits okay so that is stroke and it is uh, the most easiest uh, definition i could come across so that is why i have included so that it becomes self explanatory and you do not have to mug up okay now uh, when we classify the uh, stroke it could be either ischemic that is there is cessation of the blood or interruption to the blood supply or it could be hemorrhagic hemorrhagic means it, it is due to the rupture of the blood uh, and uh, resulting in the bleeding inside the parenchyma or outside the uh, uh, pyometer or subarachnoid hemorrhage depending upon the location of the hemorrhage okay so please remember that these are not two uh, distinct entities and ischemic stroke can convert into hemorrhagic stroke as well as hemorrhagic stroke due to the um, pressure from the blood can lead in lead to the ischemic stroke also so it is not necessarily a distinct um, entity okay they are not two different entities altogether they can develop into the different type of stroke also so ischemic stroke can develop a hemorrhagic stroke also and hemorrhagic stroke can become convert into ischemic stroke also so please remember that although we'll be dealing it for the simplicity of it and for understanding it properly we'll be dealing it separately okay any questions till now wait let's just see okay so this is clear till now now how how is a pediatric stroke different from adult stroke so we have been coming across lot of adult strokes you must have heard especially during the covid 19 times that this particular person presented with stroke and because of the vasculopathy coagulopathy so adult stroke is quite uh, often something you hear about okay so what are the various differences of a pediatric stroke from adult stroke so we all know that pediatric stroke why it is different because of the first important thing that is the fundamental biological differences from the adults i am interrupting for a minute i'm sorry uh, for the interruption so uh, we were uh, discussing about the differences of a pediatric stroke from adult stroke so first difference is that there is a fundamental biological differences so please remember in adults the chronic risk factors are more present and they are the major uh, prerequisites or predisposing factors for stroke okay whereas in children mostly it is due to the congenital and developmental risk factors okay so there are congenital abnormalities or developmental uh, problems in the brain or the vascular structures re resulting in propensity to develop stroke okay secondly children usually may have not usually i would say but may have subtle presentation for example a neonatal stroke may not be identified at that time and may be uh, um, understood or uh, may be diagnosed only when the child presents with subtle gross motor delays okay so we get lot of children with hemiparesis who do not have any history of asphyxia or anything in the neonatal period but when we go for an mri there is a proper ais acute ischemic stroke uh, not acute ischemic stroke in the past so there are features on the mri so it is usually during the neonatal period so there may be subtle presentation and the third is wide differential diagnosis so any child coming with stroke we have to work up that particular child for the underlying etiology usually in children we find an etiology and there is a 
variable etiologies for that so we are going to discuss this in detail now so there could be a ischemic stroke ischemic stroke also has lot of etiologies and the hemorrhagic stroke so hemorrhagic stroke can have the etiology so any child with stroke has to be worked up properly okay and uh, that is what i subtle presentation i have already explained so pediatric strokes usually in uh, children the uh, ischemic as well as hemorrhagic stroke are equal in uh, prevalence so uh, they like ischemic stroke is just 55% and hemorrhagic stroke is around 45% which is not very uh, Uh, they are almost equally distributed whereas in adults the ischemic strokes are more common than the hemorrhagic stroke okay hemorrhagic stroke usually occurs due to accidents and injuries and one important thing is that uh, although it is not very common in young children however it con constitute of uh, constitute 5 to 15% of all strokes in the young that is less than 25 years of age and around 0.7% of the of the total pediatric admissions are due to stroke okay so it is not that uncommon in pediatrics as, well, as it is uh, considered okay so this is the classification we have just discussed so it could be a ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke now ischemic stroke could be arterial or venous so arterial stroke uh, causes are arterial arteriopathies or vasculopathies cardiac causes and hematological causes and the second one is venous uh, thrombosis which we are going to discuss and the hemorrhagic stroke again where the causes or the etiology could be vascular or the blood disorder or could be trauma okay i hope everything is clear till now let us see if anybody has any question okay so this is just the uh, pictograph so ischemic stroke is like this so there is a occlusion in the so you can see the plaque or you can see the thrombus inside so basically this is a thrombotic blood clot resulting in cessation of the blood and the area of damage is here hemorrhagic stroke is due to the rupture of the blood vessel due to blood pressure or whatever depends upon the etiology so coming with the coming starting with the ischemic stroke now acute ischemic stroke is due to the occlusion of arterial supply we have been talking about this earlier also the most common artery which is involved is a territory of the middle cerebral artery okay so that is the most often involved artery or the uh, vessel due in the acute ischemic stroke please remember this and usually it involves the left hemisphere so the children or Uh, uh the babies generally come with right sided weakness okay or the right sided involvement stroke usually uh the incidence of stroke is a u shaped curve so it is highest during the neonatal period and during the old age and in between that is in the young age there is a low incidence okay so that is how it is a u shaped curve and the incidence ranges from 1.2 to 3 13 cases per 1 lakh children so you can see the incidence is also variable and depends upon the geographical area so it was seen in this international pediatric stroke study that this was the incidence crude incidence and it had it was done over in several countries simultaneously so that is how they came up with this and they also saw that there was a slightly male predominance in children okay uh the cause is not known exactly but it could be due to the developmental uh, differences between the male and the female child and in infants major cause of uh, stroke is usually a cardiac disease or peri perinatal asphyxia and it is usually present in the neonatal period okay so before going into detail uh, i hope everybody knows the blood supply of brain just to brush up your um, previous knowledge we are just going to discuss about this circle of villus and the brain the supply of the brain okay blood supply of the brain so we all know that brain receives blood via two systems so first is the anterior system and the second is the posterior system so anterior circulation basically consists of the paired internal carotid arteries 
and the posterior circulation is basically the paired vertebral arteries at which uh, join to form the basilar artery okay so this is called as vertebro basilar system the posterior system is also called as vertebro basilar system and the anterior system is the paired internal carotid arteries okay so how do they form the circle of villus so anterior and posterior communicating artery they link this anterior and the posterior communicating system to form this circle of villus now what happens that small perforating arteries they arise from proximal vessels so these vessels these are the proximal vessels so they are smaller perforating arteries they uh, they are basically tributaries and they go on for the distant areas on the brain so these are the perforating arteries okay now they supply the deep brain regions they go inside the brain regions like basal ganglia and thalamus and the lenticulostriate branches from the anterior system basically so anterior system basically give you lenticulostriate branches and the posterior system gives you thalamostriate branches so lenticulostriate branch will supply which structure can anybody tell me which structure lenticulostriate any answers very good so internal capsule nilayan has said right it is internal capsule which is supplied by the lenticulostriate branch and thalamo uh, striate will be supplying which structure it is easy the basal ganglia mainly the thalamus okay so this is this is what the the arterial system is okay so we have already seen this now uh, this is the areas of the brain so middle cerebral artery is the area is the artery which supply mainly the lateral surface okay so this is the middle cerebral artery the anterior cerebral artery mainly supplies the anterior medial surface and the posterior cerebral artery supplies the posterior and the inferior surface okay uh so before going this into going to this so uh, we have discussed about the circle of villus now what happens that there may be an inter individual variation amongst various people and it is relevant clinically so why because anastomosis both at the pro proximally at the circle of villus and distally through smaller leptomeningeal vessels so leptomeningeal vessels which which are which uh, provide the collateral circulation or collateral blood supply will decide the degree of the ischemia affecting the brain okay so if there is a good collateral system the brain will not be affected that much when there was a little the collateral system was not that, that well developed so please remember that uh, the stroke even with same degree of stroke there may be different presentations so not all children or adults will present with similar clinical features because of the presence of the collaterals okay so some children may have well developed collaterals and some may not have okay so that is how the brain will be affected differentially or they will have a different uh, clinical features in because of the inter individual differences in the anatomy okay now uh, so what is the pathophysiology so most common mechanism of stroke is uh, thrombus either in the cerebral arteries through the heart or from the major vessels so virchow stride you all know what is it so what happens that once there is a thromboembolism the blood supply is cut off what happens there is cerebral ischemia now it could be a primary or a secondary injury so primary injury what happens that it is due to the uh, the cellular dysfunction occurs by the ischemic insult directly when there is a different chain of events due to the ischemia of the cell uh, cellular uh, structure resulting in the um, release of various toxic substances really leading to derangements that is called as secondary injury okay so this happens now what happens that there is a central core and then there is formation of spinumbra so central core is that area where the ischemia is most severe and there is rapid infarction of that particular tissue with resulting neuronal death okay so cell death occurs in that and it is concentrated in that area 
now because of the secondary injury the area surrounding that central hole for uh, resulting in the injury okay uh, this area is also undergoing the necrosis but this area the penumbra is recoverable so if this uh, area is given perfusion or the neuroprotective um, treatment is started on time this area can recover back so it has a capacity to recover and this is the ideal time or the um, motto of a doctor to save this penumbra so that it does not lead to the increased brain damage okay so how, what what determines the extent of penumbra so the balance between cerebral metabolic rate supply of oxygen and glucose so this all has to be taken care when a child or a person comes with stroke so these things have to be targeted first okay so this is the pictorial depiction so this is the central core and this is the penumbra so if we restore the blood supply if we give the oxygen okay glucose is managed so cerebral metabolic rate is optimal this will result in a lesser degree of damage uh, brain damage okay so this is the salvageable brain area now what are the etiology of ais or the acute ischemic stroke so first is vascular or arteriopathies inflammatory it could be inflammatory or non inflammatory then heart disease and hematological disorders so we'll be discussing this one by one and definitely the prevalence of each one of them depends upon the geographical area okay now the first one is arteriopathy now arteriopathy is one of the major cause of childhood acute ischemic uh, stroke and it is present in more than 50% of children presenting with ais so arteriopathy is the major cause of ais in children what what are the various arteriopathies which can cause ais so first is transient cerebral arteriopathy which is also called as post varicella angiopathy because there is generally a history of varicella infection in the child preceding from 3 to 12 months okay so uh, that could be one of the etiology of tca the second is infective vasculitis so in our country tuberculosis is one of the major factor for this for um, infective vasculitis resulting in ais so we have to rule out this also then non infective infl inflammatory vasculitis like sle pan takayasu rheumatoid all these can also cause ais can present with ais other non inflammatory vasculopathies like moya moya disease migraine migraine can cause but it is usually transient marfan syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome fibromuscular dysplasia congenital causes like fasci syndrome allergy syndrome cardasil okay all these can also uh, have issues because of the collagen problems okay uh, leading to vasculopathy and then traumatic uh, or it could be a spontaneous uh, arterial dissection and then metabolic causes also like mela's murph burns ire organic acidemias can result in acute ischemic encephalopathy uh, sorry stroke so uh, just a brief uh, word about transient cerebral arteriopathy so usually it affects healthy school age children and most uh, commonly what happens there is irregular stenosis of the proximal mca that is unilateral usually with neighboring arteries also getting involved and associated basal ganglia infarction so there may be um, child may present with extra pyramidal symptoms like dystonia or dyskinesia okay and there is usually unilateral stenosis now it could it they it has multiple names uh, it can it is usually after post varicella varicella period and usually there is a history of varicella infection 3 to 12 months prior to the ais usually it is a self limited disorder and uh, it, it is attributed to the focal inflammation in the vascular uh, territories okay second is moya moya disease now moya moya disease is a vasculopathy with progressive stenosis of the cerebral arteries at the circle of villus so there is progressive stenosis at coe cow 
along with development of extensive collaterals from other vascular territories now these vascular territories have see so there is two things so first thing is that there is occlusion of the arterial supply and secondly because of the formation of collaterals which have a very thin wall and very friable there may be a chance of hemorrhage also from these collaterals so there could be both ischemia as well as hemorrhage so this is one example where both can occur together now the appearance of these collaterals on angiogram is given the name of puff of smoke so i'll show you the uh, photo and you can then understand so how does this puff of smoke looks like and it is associated uh, if it is associated with a syndrome like nf1 neurofibromatosis type 1 trisomy 21 okay um williams syndrome then it is called as a moya moya syndrome so if it is a entity altogether without any prior syndrome it is called as moya moya disease and if it is associated with a syndrome it is called as moya moya syndrome okay so this is how it looks like see so there is an occlusion of the internal carotid artery resulting in the formation of extensive collaterals and these are called as puff of smoke you can see this on this mri image also you can see small dots okay so this is due to the collaterals and this is the angiogram showing the puff of smoke appearance i hope this is clear now the second common cause of ais is cardiac disorders and it contributes to around 25% of total ais cases in children and more prevalent in younger children up to 2 years please remember that uh, asd atrial septal defect undiagnosed can be a major risk is usually considered to be a major risk factor okay for undiagnosed ais in children sometimes it it is quite common and we have seen that lot of children have underlying as so what what is the contributing factor in cardiac disorder so there is an abnormality in the structure there could be abnormality in the flow rhythm endothelium or the ventricular function valves blood viscosity all these things contribute to generation of thrombus with subsequent cerebral embolization so cerebral embolization usually occurs due to the defect and one of the more common defect is asd leading to the cerebral embolization and it is also a common complication and important complication after the cardiac surgeries immediately after the post operative period or during the operation the third and important cause is hematological disorders and prothrombotic conditions so this has been identified in another 25 to 50% children with acute ischemic stroke and one of the most important or strongest association uh, diseases factor 5 leiden deficiency along with protein c s deficiency anti thrombin 3 deficiency okay all these activated protein c resistance and all these things can have can lead to ais one of the major important cause of uh, pediatric stroke is sickle cell disease that is one of the important hematological condition resulting in ais and see so so much so that the ischemic stroke uh, risk in a child with sickle cell disease increases by 400 folds so this is too high okay and around 25% children of sickle cell disease usually develop cerebrovascular complications which are mostly overt ais subclinical small ais okay which can be caught later or moya moya stroke or hemorrhagic stroke also so moya moya why moya moya because there is formation of extensive collaterals in sickle cell disease also okay so this uh, puff of smoke or the small collaterals extensive collaterals may bleed and form into the hemorrhagic stroke mostly these strokes are seven, uh, ischemic accounting for 75% and hemorrhagic in 25% but as the child grows this hemorrhagic stroke incidence increases why because it is a common thing that the collaterals will keep on increasing as the age increases 
and the friability will also increase and uh, the risk is highest when there is acute sickle crisis so during this acute crisis the high, the chances are very high and therefore we have to manage the crisis very judiciously and it is cause of 10th person mortality so ais is a com is a very very important um, um, cause okay especially in africa sub african countries sub saharan countries okay another important hematological disorder which is often overlooked is iron deficiency anemia so it also is an important and very important to understand that it is a treatable risk factor so sometimes a child with stroke usually do not have any other thing but iron deficiency anemia so iron deficiency anemia if found has to be managed very judiciously we should not be very reluctant in managing it okay but the underlying pathophysiology is not very well established so uh, what are the clinical features so usually the evolution of symptoms occur uh, as a hyper in a hyper acute manner or a acute manner so what do we mean by hyper acute manner hyper acute manner means occurring within 24 hours so usually the child will come with history of sudden onset focal deficits okay so there may be focal deficits which are increasing okay and then after some time it becomes static so hyper acute presentation is there acute is usually within 7 days okay so this condition is either hyper acute or acute and the presenting symptom depends upon the definitely will depend upon the anatomy and the function of the brain areas which are affected so the common symptoms that that usually occur in a child are one or more focal neurological deficits so that is the major um, clinical feature clinical symptom then there may be dysarthria okay there may be aphasia also if the uh, if the uh, ischemia occurs in that area then facial nerve palsies may be there hemianopsia or diplopia and headache may be there extra pyramidal symptoms may occur if there is involvement of the basal ganglia usually of those lenticular uh, those um, leptomeningeal branches or that those uh, branches which supply the deep brain structures okay so there will be dystonia they can be dystonia this uh, uh, kinesias all these things can occur if there is involvement of the deep brain structure gray matter then infants and young children may manifest with non specific features like drowsiness irritability and behavioral abnormalities so you can see that there is a wide presentation in babies in young infants and children there may be non specific features so it can present like any other illness so they will have drowsiness behavioral changes okay so only with a good examination you will be able to understand whether it is a stroke or something else i hope this is clear till now okay nilayan has puff of spoke versus avm okay i will to tell you about the avm also avm usually leads to so you are talking about the arteriovenous malformation it is usually leads to the hemorrhagic stroke so we will be seeing that also uh i am dealing them separately that is why i have not included here so that you are not confused okay then approach to diagnosis and evaluation so for any child presenting with stroke presenting with focal neurological deficit without any other um, other features we have to do a neuroimaging that is the must okay so what do we do in this case so although mri is the gold standard mri is the gold standard uh, uh, investigation that has to be done but any baby any child who has presented with us we have to do a ct okay where the stroke is uh, strongly suspected why do we need uh, a ct in all these cases can anybody tell me sorry so see that in a resource limited country in india we do not have mri machines everywhere first of all secondly mri is a time consuming 
uh, investigation and needs expertise plus it needs sedation okay so child cannot um, uh, like um, it's difficult for a child to lie down still and will need mostly will need anesthesia or a heavy sedation which is not given in a stroke patient so mri usually is not a good modality in our setting however if the mri is available along with um appropriate clinical personnel mri is the gold standard so that has to be done then dsa is also a gold standard for diagnosing the vasculopathy so that can be done and then pcd so it basically helps as a it is basically for a profile access so we uh, uh, do a prophylactic screening in a child with sickle cell disease as stroke prevention so it basically tells you about the blood flow velocity in major cerebral vessels so any child coming first we have to do a neuroimaging it it is preferably mri however if it is not available then ct has to be done okay so it can tell you at least about the hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke so ischemic stroke is missed usually on ct however hemorrhagic stroke will be easily identified so you will have at least some idea whether it is a hemorrhagic stroke or not okay and mri is usually has to be complemented by the mra or the mrv depending upon the etiology or whatever th uh, clinical suspicion you have okay so that was the first thing which we, which has to be done now for all children usually we do a underlying investigations to uh, understand the etiology so what are the mandatory investigations which has to be done in all the cases so these are the mandatory investigations as we read according to the uh, etiologies then level 2 is something which is preferable in all but may be individualized depending upon the clinical presentation or the history okay here we will do about the prothrombotic condition we will rule out so in our setting we usually do the level 1 and level 2 in all cases and then level 3 is done in selected children depending upon the history and the preceding illnesses so if there was a pre preceding respiratory infection and we are suspecting mycoplasma uh, mycoplasma infection then a serology may help then if we are suspecting any rheumatological disorder then ana profile anti dsd dna can be done mitochondrial disorders okay if there is a recurrent history of stroke then we go for mitochondrial uh, uh, investigations like lactate okay mitochondrial mutations biopsy etc similarly for iem sickle cell disease okay usually tb is ruled out in all however it may depend depending upon the individual countries or the uh, the protocol which is being followed okay and in especially in the adolescence we should rule out suspected use of illicit drugs drug abuse okay so how do we manage so i had told you earlier that the main principle of management is to decrease the penumbra or to uh, not allow the penumbra to grow okay so how do we achieve it by striking a balance between the cerebral metabolic rate the glucose requirement and the oxygen requirement so that is what we have to basically see so uh, when a child with these with stroke comes suspected stroke comes we have to follow the abc so we have to stabilize the child okay we have to take care of the airway breathing circulation we have to maintain the oxygenation we have to give treatment for fever so that the cerebral metabolic rate is not very high okay the metabolic rate is decreased then if there is a hypertension that has to be managed hypoglycemia has to be managed okay and in children with uh, sickle cell disease usually it is important why because usually they come with acute crisis and acute crisis uh, is usually due to fever or dehydration so we have to maintain the hydration and exchange transfusion may be required okay so whenever you are asked about the management please start with the basic management do not start with the management of like thrombolysis or something which we will be discussing later you start with the maintenance or the 
stabilization of the child supportive care that is the most important thing okay then coming to the management of seizures and raised icd that is very important because raised icd and seizures itself increases the cerebral metabolic requirement and further in, uh, may increase the size of the penumbra so how do we manage a child with raised icd so so positioning is important giving oxygen supplemental oxygen is important then giving drugs like mannitol and hypertonic saline okay that is important so uh, keeping the head in the midline so these are the various modalities to manage the raised icp second is uh, sometimes if there is very uh, uh, malignant edema which is not being taken care by this these modalities then we may have to give a decompressive craniectomy okay so that that is one medical uh, that is one surgical management and seizures have to be managed so you must have uh, got a class on status epilepticus so these children may present with seizures so that has to manage that has to be managed uh, appropriately now comes the thrombolytic therapy so there is no conclusive evidence in uh, the safety efficacy of the thrombolytic therapy in children however it may be required especially in those conditions where there is a pro thrombotic condition okay and there may be a there may uh, may be a risk of recurrent stroke so the anticoagulant therapy is either acute or not either it is given as acute phase anticoagulation and long term anticoagulation so long term anticoagulation usually is given in those children who are who have a, a risk of development of recurrent strokes okay so what do we give in acute phase uh, antithrombotic therapy so first is low molecular weight heparin so enoxaparin is the trade name of that particular thing and it is usually beneficial in arterial dis dissection and inherited prothrombotic states why do we use it over the heparin so it has a fewer side effect it is easily administered and needs lesser monitoring antiplatelet drugs can also be given usually in the arteriopathies now when, when is long term anticoagulation required so usually with the risk of recurrent stroke especially those who have a structural heart disease who has a high risk of cardio embolism who have had carotid artery dissection or who have inherited prothrombotic states and these are given for 3 to 12 months or may be given more uh, de depending upon the underlying condition surgical management includes revascularization surgery and emergency decompressive craniectomy so craniectomy is something which is done in emergency whereas revascularization surgeries depend upon the uh, clinician's uh, discretion when do when do they decide so there is no particular timing when they should be done and very important is that after all these things when there is the acute phase has been managed so for the residual problems or residual uh, issues the rehabilitation has to be started early on so that the uh, child's brain starts working so cimt is something cimt is uh, con constraint induced motor training so what do we do in that so if supposingly if a child has a left sided uh, sorry right sided hemiparesis so uh, the left limbs will be constrained so that the right limbs are uh, basically asked to move so they are Uh, given extra work so the right side has to work and therefore the left side which is a better side will not work and the right side will regain its lost strength okay so this is how they, these are some principle which are to be done okay and then the comorbid conditions like seizures etc have to be managed so this is just a case we can discuss so a healthy 3 year old boy who doesn't have any previous significant illness comes with sudden onset left sided weakness the neurological examination demonstrates left sided hemisensory loss and neglect so when we do a imaging neuroimaging we can see that there is a area of infarct okay so there is 
increased signal intensity in the right temporal parietal region and this is in the distribution of the mca okay when mr angiogram is done so you can see that there is occlusion in the corresponding branch of the mca if we compare it from the left side okay after 3 months we can see that there is gliosis in the same region so this is the gliosis okay so this these are the mr images diffusion weighted image so diffusion weighted mr is the modality of choice when uh, in a child with stroke another one so a newborn a term newborn develops focal right sided seizures at 16 hours of life so one thing which i would like to tell you that neonatal seizures or sorry neonatal um, stroke usually gets unnoticed however if it is of a good intensity then it might present with focal seizures usually between 12 to 48 hours of life okay so this child this baby presents at 16 hours of life so this is the diffusion weighted image on the day 2 of the uh, illness where a neonatal arterial ischemic stroke is being identified okay there is a restriction of the diffusion in left mca territory and after 12 months you can see cystic encephalomalacia so cysts are formed and the scarring is there in the same territory so you can see this scarring also okay and this child will present with hemi paresis or hemiplegic cp okay any questions till now yes so ncct is the first thing okay now cerebro venous sinus thrombosis i'll uh, try to cover it early now so this uh, this is also a type of ischemic stroke we have read it about uh, we have uh, discussed the uh, classification so what happens that it includes thrombosis within the cerebral venous system and usually the incidence is underestimated however it is approximately 1 per 1 lakh children so that was around 1.3 per uh, uh, 1.3 to 13 children per um, sorry in 1 lakh children per year this is 1 per 1 lakh and it accounts for 25 percent cases of ischemic strokes in children and this is also highest in during the neonatal period so this is again a u shaped curve again there is a male predominance and please remember that superficial vena system is affected more commonly sorry this is not a u shaped curve okay these are this is less common in adults this is more common in children okay so uh, sorry for that now uh, just a little uh, word about the venous system so i hope you all know about the superficial and the inferior uh, deep system so two venous systems are there superficial and deep so how superficial venous system is there so there is a cortical vein that drains the cortical and subcortical areas so these are the cortical veins so these basically um, drains the cortical and subcortical areas and they go medially towards the superior sagittal sinus sorry so these this is the superior sagittal sinus so these all these are cortical veins okay now the deep vein network what happened so it includes the internal cerebral vein let me see it okay so there is internal cerebral medullary thalamic and choroidal veins which basically converge centrally uh, at the vein of gallen so this is the vein of gallen so all these they basically convert converge um, uh, centrally at the vein of gallen and this vein of gallen uh, drains into this straight sinus and they all meet at tophula okay, so this superficial and the deep system meets at the tophula and the bilateral transverse sinus so this is the bilateral transverse so these are two transverse sinuses and they then drain in laterally into the jugular veins internal jugular veins so this is the superficial and the deep system and most commonly csvt occurs in the superficial system okay and your av malformation which we were talking about usually occurs in the deep system mostly in the vein of gallen 
so i'll be showing you that so again there is a mechanism of thromboembolism you know virchow stride and all i'm not going to discuss this in detail so what happens that when there is a occlusion it leads to increase in the venous pressure now it can occur focally also or it could occur globally resulting in diffuse increased icp or there could be a focal increase uh, occlusion resulting in uh, failure of venous emptying resulting in the local increased tissue pressure with transudation of the fluid across the uh, venous or the capillary channel resulting in vasogenic edema without any true infarction however if this continue then this infarction uh, uh, however when if it is uh, continuing then there is an increase in the regional tissue pressure resulting eventually in uh, the increased incoming arterial perfusion pressure and hence permanent infarction i hope this is clear so it could be diffuse or single or focal usually it is initially it is vasogenic edema without any true infarction however if it keeps on increasing if it is not managed then there is increase in the regional pressure and decreased arterial uh, perfusion resulting in permanent infarction please uh, give me i have to just briefly interrupt sorry for the interruption so what are the risk factors again most commonly it is the pro thrombotic disorders then comes the dehydration then systemic infection uh, head and neck infection okay then other head and neck disorders malignancies hematological disorders and cardiac disorders so most common causes pro thrombotic disorder followed by dehydration we see a lot of children with dehydration coming with csvt now what are the clinical features so please remember again that it is occurring mostly in infants and neonates uh, and it they constitute around 50% uh, of patients mostly there are diffuse neurological signs and focal deficits are not that common as it is seen in ais okay and they are more likely to develop gradually so like in the ais there was a acute or a hyper acute presentation this is usually a gradual presentation okay and the symptoms may worsen abruptly now the common clinical presentations are headache lethargy nausea and vomiting and signs of raised icd leading to uh, papillary edema or six nerve palsy so please remember that all these things are quite common in idiopathic intracranial hypertension also therefore if any child comes with raised uh, icd headache and papillary edema csvt has to be excluded before labeling that child with idiopathic intracranial hypertension so this is one of the dd of csvt please write it down so how do we manage again as somebody said earlier said that uh, ct ncct that too is the major is the first neuroimaging which has to be done so however it is inadequate but it can at least uh, mention about whether it is a hemorrhagic stroke or not and it can also sometimes appear as a hyperdense sinus okay so that is something then cct is quite sensitive so that is what we do usually and thrombus how does it appear it appears as a filling defect and it is called as empty triangle or empty delta sign so ct cct is important mri along with mrv is the preferred imaging modality okay uh, how do we manage again with anticoagulation that we have already discussed and non antithrombotic therapies again so neuroprotective management has to be there there and usually there is an underlying sepsis so we have already discussed that infections constitute a major part 
and those infections have to be managed appropriately so this is a case this is a 9 year old girl presenting with fever for 5 days pain and discharge from right ear and then progressive right sided headache after that she complained of double vision along with papilledema on examination so this was the ct angiogram so ct venography was done and you can see that there is a filling defect okay so there is a large thrombus in the right transverse sinus so this is the transverse sinus and there is a large thrombus however it is not very good uh, in this it is not uh, visible but you can see it here there is a this should be opacified like this here it is opaque however in this you can see a filling defect see you can see this so there is a hypodense area in between this this is the um this is due to the thrombus okay in the transverse sinus uh on assessment the cause was otitis media and mastoiditis with septic thromboembolism thrombophlebitis okay of the transverse sinus so this is the um, you can take a, a screenshot so this is how this is the approach how do we go for it so see in any child with acute ischemic stroke if it is suspected then after giving a neuroprotective therapy we have to go for a neuroimaging so if the mri is available then we go for it dwi however if it is not available then ncct along with angiogram is usually done if the parenchyma is normal or there is a mild hypodensity along with no hemorrhage if the it is there then acute ischemic stroke is there however if it is not there then it could be csvt hemorrhage anything so if there is ais then we have to see whether there is a vascular occlusion on ct angiogram if we find that then ais is confirmed if we do not find it then we go for further imaging mri and angiography etc in this case mri if it was it was available then if we find the typical features then acute ischemic stroke is likely and then we go for a vascular occlusion on mri if it is found then we go for this so it is similar to that if it comes in your next examination that what is the modal uh, golden um, uh, modality of choice or something then you have to go for dw mri dwi mri because that is something which we have to do okay so that is the gold standard okay coming to the hemorrhagic stroke so hemorrhagic stroke is uh, something occurring due to the rupture of cerebral blood vessels and usually what happens that there is abnormal blood vessels either due to vascular mal malformations or it could be because of the bleeding diathesis leading to uh, uh, hemorrhage even if the vessels are normal and usually it is a neurological emergency and uh, has a high mortality rate so there should be it should be managed immediately it should be managed as a emergency it usually has a high recurrence risk also so what are the types so it could be intracerebral that is in, uh, intracerebral could be parenchymal parenchymal or intraventricular usually intraventricular is found in neonates then subarachnoid epidural and subdural so i will not be talking about these two okay i am just briefly i'll be talking about the sh so these are the areas where it could occur uh, the incidence is again 1 to 5 per lakh children and it is quite high uh, usually there has to be a cause so usually the etiology is uh, fine, found in these cases and how does it differ from ais uh, sorry so it usually differs uh, it the etiology usually differs however there may be some overlap which we already discussed that in moya moya in uh, sickle cell disease and in post infectious and congenital vasculopathies there is chance of both the ischemic and the hemorrhagic uh, strokes okay uh, usually there is a high mortality in the acute period however when there is a uh, survivor is there there is a um, better prognosis in these survivors 
but long term risk uh, of recurrence is higher in this now intracerebral um, hemorrhagic stroke so this is either intraparenchymal or it could be intraventricular the majority of events are usually supratentorial okay however infratentorial can also occur can somebody tell me what is supratentorial and infratentorial and both or both the left and right hemispheres are equally involved ais usually involve the left hemisphere okay uh, now in contrast to acute ischemic stroke the brain tissue the lesional uh, uh, brain tissue which is destroyed is usually displaced rather than this damage so there is a displacement rather than damage therefore the long term prognosis is better in this case so what happens when there is a uh, there is a rupture of a vessel there is presence of a blood product which uh, usually damages the blood brain barrier now this thing promotes the cerebral edema which can lead to neurological deficit seizures and increase in icp depending upon the lesion location and size these symptoms occur this can either cause immediate brain stem compression leading to death or it may uh, cause these symptoms and once these are taken care of the symptoms usually go off and the prognosis is good okay uh, if it occurs in um, the flow of the csf the uh, Uh, it can cause obstructive hydrocephalus, and in the the SH, the subarachnoid hemorrhage usually cause non-obstructive hydrocephalus. Okay. So this is the SH. So again, uh, the SH causes vasoconstriction due to the breakdown products, which cause vasospasm and leads to additional ischemic stroke. This is how subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, is seen so because the arachnoid villi helps in absorption of csf if these structures are destroyed by subarachnoid uh, uh, hemorrhage there is non obstructive hydrocephalus so these are the risk factors you can just take it down so what are the clinical features of a hemorrhagic stroke so these three are the most important features and if they are present it should be considered as a hemorrhage stroke until proved otherwise okay so if a child comes with thunder crap headache along with associated nausea or vomiting and neurological symptoms which could be in the form of alteration in the consciousness seizures or progressive presentation of these things along with bulbar signs okay so difficulty in swallowing feeding all these things ataxia and rapid deterioration to coma these should be considered as hemorrhagic stroke systemic examination may what do we find so we may find clues to etiology like bruy which could be due to some av malformation skin lesions purpura telangiectasia and hemangiomas which are usually found in sturge weber syndrome markers on infective endocarditis or recognizable genetic syndrome so usually there is an underlying genetic syndrome which may have propensity for hemorrhagic strokes and in sh meningeal signs and fever occurs so this is very important and it could be a dd for meningitis however in subarachnoid hemorrhage when you do a tap you will find xanthochromatosis okay then retinal examination may also reveal subhyoid uh, retinal hemorrhages in sh how do young children and infants present so they will present with non specific features like irritability bulging fontanel behavior changes so again you will confuse it with meningitis so lp is required in these cases and unique presentation may be there in vein of gallen malformation where they can present with uh, macrocephaly and congestive heart failure so this is a vein of gallen malformation so you can see in mri image there is a low signal void within the dilated vein of gallen okay okay so this is the sagittal section now diagnosis so again neuroimaging is the uh, most important uh, diagnostic modality and uh, the first thing which we do ncct 
that is uh, that can easily identify whether it is a hemorrhage or not okay and um, after that ct angio may give additional information regarding which vessel is involved if the ct is normal lp can help in excluding these anthrocromia especially in sph mri however a better modality usually is quite limiting especially in a uh, resource limited setting like india and gradient echocardiography can be done to detect small micro bleeds okay uh, in conditions where the micro bleeds are usually can occur like moya moya or scd etc so how do we manage again there is a neuroprotective uh, or the stabilization which have we have already discussed then the neurosurgical intervention is usually required in all these cases around 80% cases require that and that is to emergency neurosurgical intervention is required uh, medical management is usually required for the underlying conditions which predispose to hemorrhagic uh, stroke like if there is infection then antibiotics may be required like endocarditis then deficient factors so replacement of that for example in hemophilia case okay offending drugs like um, uh, uh if the child is on prolonged uh, anti thrombotic therapy okay so vitamin k is given immunomodulatory therapy for inflammatory conditions like itp okay so that is to be given now this is again another case witness where a 7 year old boy with hemophilia with diagnosed hemophilia a presents with sudden onset severe headache vomiting and right sided focal seizures so all these three are present now a ct has been done so you can see that there is a intraparenchymal bleed on the left basal ganglia so this is the and when the mri is done a dwi image shows acute infarct in left mca territory so there is an in, uh, infarct as well as there is a so this infarct is not very visible in ct however when this is done on mri it can it shows the infarct also okay so what is the prognosis so uh, there is a high mortality in hemorrhagic uh, stroke as compared to acute ischemic and uh, vena stroke sorry this is 10 to 12% five i think by mistake has been written so 10 to 12% only in survivors there is a long term mor morbidity except in cases with hemorrhagic stroke hemorrhagic stroke usually has a good long term prognosis uh around 90% children who have had stroke early may have long term neurological complications okay so what are these neurological comorbidities it could be motor deficit okay, usually presenting with spastic hemiparesis or dystonia cognitive deficits may be there so these children usually do not attain their maximum potential and the seizures may be there what are the prognostic factors uh, which indicate poor outcome if there has been a cerebral cortex involvement this is especially for the acute ischemic stroke the area of the infarct was large and in moya moya disease because usually it is recurrent and it may convert into hemorrhagic stroke as well okay in csvt the poor prognostic indicators are if the child presents with stupor or coma at the presentation um if there is intracranial hemorrhage along with like this is again if there is hemorrhagic stroke along with the venous uh, infarct and if the deep venous system is involved so usually superficial venous system is involved if these if the deep venous system is involved it is a poor prognostic indicator these are some conditions which look like stroke in children however they are not and they have to be differentiated okay so migraine sometimes can present like a stroke so there could be focal neurological deficits and headache vomiting which may uh mimic a hemorrhagic stroke so you may say that this could be a stroke however if we do a imaging it will it will be absolutely normal seizures can present with tort's palsy okay usually the focal seizures and uh imaging again will be normal infection like nk uh, can present with fever encephalopathy gradual onset meningismus so sh can very well uh in um uh, mimic menin uh, meningitis however we may find different uh, features on imaging okay then demyelination disorders hypoglycemia can present with this 
then hypertensive encephalopathy press can present with stroke iems although iem itself is a uh, feature of uh, stroke but it may mimic that also so iem we can keep as a not as a mimic but as a etiology okay vestibulopathy so vestibulopathy is very important because this these children will present with uh, unstable gait vertigo imbalance okay and this this has a gradual onset so they may mimic stroke so we uh, may uh, find them as a gradual onset and evolving kind of stroke however the imaging is absolutely normal cerebellar ataxia channelopathies can also present with uh, features of um um uh, imbalance okay weakness so all these thing will, will be there however the um, imaging will be absolutely normal and then alternating hemiplegia so it is basically a type of migraine and there is a family history also and the imaging is absolutely normal okay usually there are extra pyramidal symptoms in this so this was all about stroke we have uh, surpassed the time also okay so uh, shiveha has asked me why is there chf in vein of gallen malformation so can somebody else answer this question Uh, I'll just give you one minute if somebody can answer. Otherwise, I'll answer this question. The uh, question. So, uh, Nilayan has asked me to repeat the question. So, uh, Shiveha has asked me why is there CHF in vein of Gallen malformation? so nobody is okay hi very good high output cardiac failure good so uh, basically what happens that uh, usually there is a high because of the okay somebody has answered increased icd less arterial perfusion back pressure on heart no not sure nilayan you were right that it is usually a high cardiac output failure uh so that is why there is cardiac failure in these cases okay and i will also have to review what is the exact cause but i just remember that it is a high output cardiac failure you also review any other question okay so thank you very much i hope uh, all of you have understood the basic difference between the ischemic and the hemorrhagic stroke and you will write if something comes and uh, especially in your next examination you can uh, write down something okay uh, please remember that um, uh, your next means your pg entrance i'm talking about so uh, gold standard if being asked then you have to write dwi or mri along with the um, angiogram however if it is uh, asked that most suitable then you can write ncct with the angiogram then followed by the angiogram ct angio okay so i'm ending the webinar